got to ask right off the bat, how are you doing? How's your family? How's everybody around you? You know, I'm, I'm, um, I had kind of an interesting start to the year. I, I did an enormous amount of travel in the first two months. And uh, sort of just as all of the madness started, I, I flew home. And um, gosh, I'm, I'm just a glass half full kind of a guy. I'm really trying to soak in the time with my family. I mean, so often I'm sort of on the other end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm longing to be at home, but I'm on the road. And right now, it just feels incredible to be to be at home and to be with the people that I love the most. You know, I wish I could spend more time with friends, um, but having time with my wife and my six and a half year old daughter right now is right. Uh, is, is pretty amazing. That said, I will say the uh, the homeschooling routine, the remote schooling, it's a new reality. I haven't um, tried to work in my in my house um, and have my daughter learning and my wife trying to be a teacher and you know running the household. That's challenging. I'm not going to lie, but mm -hmm. um, but overall, I mean, I'm really trying to. Th this is a special moment in time, despite the chaos in the world in terms of as a family unit. It's pretty amazing to be with my family and not see anything on the calendar. Yeah, I get that. But you know, you travel a lot for a living. You're on the road most of the time. I know the whole the whole shifting of everything. We've been working remotely from Nikon, and I've got my apartment pretty much the living area set up as this little production studio, but. We're happy to be able to talk to you today and, and, and really thank you for your time because I know you've probably done many of these interviews already. And we really want this to be about some really great inspiration and education. I don't want you selling anything to me during this talk. I want the backstories to all of these great pictures. Now, we reached out to you and asked you to put together a collection of your favorite images, about five to, to seven images and talk about them and get deep into the stories because I think people love that. Do you agree? Uh, hey, I, you know, it's, I think it's why I actually fell in love with photography as a kid. It was the, it was the storytelling. It's really, you know, what drives me, you know, I, I fell in love with photography when I was 13 years old, but climbing, rock climbing came first. I went on a climbing trip and I had such an incredible experience. I was outside, I was having adventure where the outcome wasn't certain. I was challenged mentally, challenged physically. I was in an incredible place. And I came back to the schoolyard on a Monday morning and told, you know, stood on the playground and shared the stories with my buddies. And I realized that the verbal oral story wasn't enough. I needed visual proof. And so I borrowed my dad's SLR camera. And the next Saturday, I went rock climbing again. And, and I tried to make pictures that were compelling, that told the story. And they weren't very good. The pictures were pretty mediocre, to be honest. And I realized in that one week span from Saturday to Saturday, I just realized, you know, it wasn't about having a great piece of equipment, a great camera that helps, but it was what's up here and what's in here in your heart. It's communicating with visuals. And I didn't know, you know, now it's easy to look back in the rear view mirror, I'm 43. But 30 years ago, when I went on that first rock climbing trip and then borrowed my dad's camera, that it would really influence the rest of my life. I mean, it, you know, that was the most pivotal, you know, two Saturdays in a row. And uh, now I like to joke, I'm totally unemployable, except for taking pictures and telling stories. So that's a long winded way of saying I love talking about photography. And, and it's for me, it's even less about the final deliverable, that photograph, it's actually the backstory that's so satisfying. It's why I do it. I want the, I'm the guy, I'm more about the journey, you know, to travel hopefully is better than to arrive. It's, it's less even for me about that final one frame that's incredible. It's the experience getting there. It's, it's the reason why you wrote your recent book, no? That, it's true, yeah, I, I just, I wrote a book called Stories Behind the Images. And it's, um, it's 56 of my, not necessarily my favorite photos or my best photographs, but 56 photographs that have meaningful stories, that great stories, oftentimes lessons that, that I learned via making mistakes. Um, they're caricatures of the incredible people that I've had an opportunity to work with, some technical lessons, and, and a lot of self-deprecating stories, the mistakes that I've made. And it's, you know, the idea of paying it forward, right? We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And um, I've learned from mentors and I felt like this is my moment to pay it forward. And, I, and to be honest, I wanted to have all of these stories cataloged someplace. You know, I have a little girl and I, 
you know, knock on wood, but if I ever got hit by a bus, I want her to know who I am. Um, and I'm also realizing that the older I get, some of the details of those stories are getting fuzzy. And right. so I realized the sooner I kind of write some of this down, one, I hope other people can enjoy it, but, but it's also preserved for, for history. It, you know, it's down in writing. And so that experience of writing the book and recounting the stories of these 56 pictures, one of the most satisfying experiences thus far. I mean, it was really fun. And the, the most enjoyable part, Mike, I have to say, it's I love the people that we get to spend time with as photographers. I mean, you know, we say this in, in various ways, but the camera is sort of a, it's the golden ticket or the backstage pass to life. Mm -hmm. And I look at my career and the experiences that we collectively have as photographers, we're granted these opportunities because of the cameras to slip into worlds and experiences that otherwise you know, folks don't have access to. And, and this book, Stories Behind the Images, really is to celebrate those experiences it's, and to share those experiences, you know, the positive outcomes and the lessons learned with the world around us. And I'm just, you know, every time I recount these stories, I'm just thankful that I picked up my dad's camera when I was a kid. I, th I think the key to that too is explaining the things that go wrong because a lot of times people will, will view a photographer's work and they'll think that in an instant that picture was made without any backstory whatsoever, which is yeah. why this is such a great fun time to get on um, this um, conference with you or this chat with you and, sure. and really just get into these stories. Now, uh, listen, people who know us understand this, but you and I have a bit of a history together. We've worked together for decades now. And uh, it's been a great ride. We've been on many mountains together. I don't rock climb like you do, but uh, we've had uh, quite a bit of experiences. And um, so again, not only do I consider you somebody I work with, you're a brother. And, and I guess we can't share all of those stories, but the good news is, is this is so rough cut what we're doing here. And if anything happens in the background, we're gonna roll with it, okay? That sounds perfect. You know, Mike, one thing you just said that that's worth commenting on is I think people, there's the illusion when a professional photographer shows a photograph that it's, you know, it's quick work. And every time you press that shutter, it's a great photograph. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I'm, I, I'm sitting here in, in my home office. This is an office that my wife and I share. You know, usually I'm in my office across town. And, but behind me is our filing cabinets. And these filing cabinets are full of slide film. And there's eight of these four drawer filing cabinets behind me. And I bet, I mean, I'm doing some loose math. There's a million pictures in there, a million slides. And, you know, I stopped shooting slide film, what, 10 or 15 years ago at this point. And in these million slides, these are the selects. These are the best frames. I threw away 80% of the pictures. These are the 20% that I thought were worthy of keeping. Mm -hmm. And out of that, you know, so call it a couple of million pictures that I shot. You know, I've got a few hundred solid pictures, good pictures, a few really great pictures, a few hundred good pictures. And I, and I tell that story because I think that's what people don't see right. is that we shoot tens of thousands of pictures. You know, as professionals, we can constantly, that's our job is to shoot good pictures. We can always right. shoot good pictures. We're going to show up and shoot good every time, but we're going to shoot thousands to get to good. And we're going to shoot tens of thousands to get to great. And it's rare, like in a career, it was one of the most humbling experiences putting this book together that to get it down to 56 images, you know, I looked at a few hundred pictures. It wasn't a lot deeper than that. You know, you spend a career, you know, now I'm halfway through my career is probably safe to say, but it's really hard to get to great. Good, you can consistently shoot good. Getting to great, really, really hard and rare. And, and so this just speaks, it speaks to you shoot volume, you shoot a lot. We just don't, you know, as professionals, we don't show all the mistakes. And that's kind of, I think part of the spirit of today is to talk about some of the blunders and, and mistakes to get to great. So you, you talk about millions, was it difficult to pare it down? I know it's difficult to pare it down to the 50 plus in your book. Is it difficult to pare it down to about five or six? You know, I, you know, and I also had the same philosophy when you messaged and said, you know, let's talk about five or six pictures today. Mm -hmm. In my head, I thought, you know, I, I can't, I can't distill it down to the five or six best pictures. And so I actually distilled it down to the five or six that in that moment, you know, that, that had kind of the, oh, good. That, that, that felt that, that I felt something, right? That's what this is all about. Photography is about feeling. 
it's really subjective. There's no, it's not black and white. Is it good or great? It's, um, right. it's really about what you feel in your heart. And, and I think the pictures that we're going to talk about today are as much, it's really about the people and the experiences that I had. And, and a few of them are turning point moments in my career, but all of the people in these photographs are, are really near and dear to me. And so that was, uh, this is really based on the experiences. That's why I picked the pictures, not necessarily, are they the greatest? Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to make maneuvers. So I apologize for looking away for a second. Um, I'm going to share this screen so we can pull up a nice presentation of your work. And can you see your image in the background now? I think we got it going. I, I sure can. Yeah, yeah, I sure can. So I think this particular image I've seen you present before, this leads into, you know, a discussion about how your career got started. So what a great place to start. Take it away. Yeah. I mean, you know, early on, I, I fell in love with photography and and had a couple of lucky breaks. Um, I, I started, I took six months off from college and I traveled around the Western United States photographing rock climbing. And at the end of that six months on the road, I submitted my best action pictures to Climbing Magazine and my best lifestyle pictures to Patagonia, the clothing mm -hmm. company. And, and both companies were incredibly receptive and, and they both became clients overnight, regular repeat clients overnight. You know, I had since moved back into my dormitory at San Jose State. And, um, and I just, as they started licensing pictures, using pictures in the catalog and in the magazine, I had a revolving fund, right? I had enough money coming in that I could go out and buy another 100 rolls of Fuji Velvia film and fill up my gas tank and drive around the Western United States every weekend mm -hmm. and photograph rock climbing. Um, but I, be, I befriended a guy that was living in the dormitories down the hallway, Tom Bulo. And uh, mm -hmm. Tom was a former big wave surfer going to school for medicine. And, uh, you know, Tom and I were very like-minded and that I came from the climbing culture and the surf culture has some real parallels, you know, pursuit of wild, beautiful, natural environments and kind of looking for those very special moments, you know, getting barreled in a wave or hanging on rock high in the mountains. And Tom one day knocked on my door and he said, Corey, you know, there's a huge swell coming into mainland Mexico, meaning there's going to be great surf. And so we concocted a plan at the 11th hour and I called Patagonia. I was doing a lot of work for Patagonia at the time. And the way those assignments would play out is they would say, Corey, you know, who's going on the trip with you? And I would say, you know, my buddy Tom and this friend, and they would send us a box of clothing in their sizes. And I had one requirement, it was shoot photojournalistic documentary pictures, gritty raw photographs of my buddies traveling. And so we loaded six surfboards onto the roof of Tom's pickup truck. And we had $800 between us, if I remember correctly. And we spread that $800 into like eight equal parts throughout the truck, some in the glove box, some under the seat, some in the coffee maker. And, uh, and we had a couple of um, travelers checks and we headed down to mainland Mexico to a little fishing village called Pascuales, Mexico. And it's definitely not a tourist destination. There was one little hotel where you could stay and it was really uh, an amalgamation of, of brick uh, bungalows with no windows and no mosquito net where the door opened. And so you just sweat it out in there getting bit by mosquitoes. And, but it was gritty and raw this town. There was one cantina where we ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, um, and Tom, it was an incredible trip, beautiful photographs, but Tom got stung by a bunch of jellyfish mm. and went into anaphylactic shock. And it turned out the only woman in the fishing village who could administer an epinephrine injection happened to be the waitress at the local cantina. And so here we are, laying, Tom, here's Tom laying on the same tables where we ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you know, his Patagonia surf trunks pulled down kind of halfway down his ass. And, and I'm, you know, this is, this is a bad photo by any standard. It's, I'm shooting too wide. I have, you know, 20 millimeter lens on, direct flash on the camera. I'm blasting Tom, his face is out of focus. I should have cropped it to vertical. But at the end of this trip, I shipped all of my film to Patagonia. And, um, and the way that it worked back then is I would ship the raw film, Patagonia would process my film, and they would keep the images that they thought had potential and ship right. the rejects back. 
And now, and I'll admit if this image had landed on my light table back in my dorm room, I had a four foot light table and I bought a hundred dollar loop, you know, I was, I was big time back then in my right. dorm room, but I would have slid this image right into the trash can. You know, this is a reject in my mind, but Jane Sievert, who was the picture editor at Patagonia at the time, she had a different vision. She saw this photo and she pulled it as a select. And a few months later, this image got cropped to a vertical and it ran as a full page ad in uh, an outside magazine. And this is in the heyday of print. So this was a big, expensive ad that a lot of eyeballs saw. And, and Jane just had a vision for this gritty, raw photograph and paired with some incredible copy written by the copy team at Patagonia. You know, it really turned some heads. And, and that was a long way of getting to kind of the real key to the story. Not only did Jane identify this photograph as an ad and they, and boldly they used this ad because this is not traditional advertising in the late nineties, but it was in the middle of the dot-com boom, the first dot-com boom. And an executive from a company called Quokkasports.com was flying home from Europe. He's sitting in a first class cab and flying home, flipping through outside magazine sees this photograph, tears it out, writes a note to his assistant that says, track this photographer down. This is the gritty raw look that we want for our company. And so at this point I've transferred from San Jose State to Fresno State. I want it to be closer to Yosemite National Park. And I'm sitting in my apartment, the phone rings, you know, I'm pretty savvy. Hello, office of Corey Rich. No, I I didn't actually say that. But I pick up the phone and this assistant says, are you available for a meeting tomorrow in San Francisco? And so I've upgraded from my Honda Civic now and I'm driving a Ford Econoline van. And I'm so excited. I drive to San Francisco that night. And I, on the way, I just bought like generation one cell phone. It was like the size of a brick. And I remember it was like $2 a minute to make a phone call. But they speak. Yeah. and, And the assistant actually said, Corey, we might have an assignment for you in the Sahara Desert. And I thought, oh, this is incredible, an assignment. And this was new territory for me. Everything that I was doing thus far was on spec, meaning I went out, oftentimes my expenses were covered, but I would shoot photographs. And then if they liked the photo, they would license it. I would get a check for the, for the usage of the photograph. So I called one of my mentors, a fellow San Jose State alum, Brad Mange, and Brad was Gosh, as big time as it got, just shooting all the Sports Illustrated. Brad. Brad yeah, is Brad, one of my butt. In, incredible guy, just one of one of the one of my mentors and just good buddies. And I called Brad from my cell phone while you know it's two dollars a minute, so I was trying to be you know conscientious of time. And I'm driving my big van, <clears throat> and and I remember getting Brad. It's you know seven or eight at night. I can hear a bunch of guys in the background, and I realize Brad's like playing poker or something. And I say, Brad, I've got, you know, I I think I might get an assignment. What am I worth? I don't know what I cost. And I could tell Brad didn't want to talk to me at the moment. He said, you know what? I don't know, Corey. I'm pretty busy. You're a thousand bucks. That's what he said. You're a thousand bucks. And, you know, I could hear the wind of the phone as he hung up on me. And, and, you know, that's all I had seared into my brain. And the next morning I'm sitting in Quokkasports.com, this incredible office overlooking the bay. And my portfolio gets passed around the table. And eventually, Brian Turkelson, this executive, gets to my this page of the Patagonia ad. Really, it was just tear sheets. It was all photographs that I had published, magazine covers and spreads and ads. And he says, oh, this is the gritty, raw look that we want for our company. And he says, um, eventually, he says, we have this trip in the Sahara Desert. And he describes it a little bit. And he says, but the big question is, what do you cost? And it just took everything in me to say, you know, Brian, I'm, I'm a thousand dollars. And I didn't even know what I meant. I didn't know what, a th- you know, I'll go to, and in my head, I'm thinking I would for a thousand bucks, go to the Sahara desert. This would be incredible. If I can make a thousand bucks and go to the Sahara desert, this is incredible. And, and Brian, you know, master negotiator, he says, Ooh, that's pretty steep, Corey. Um, we were thinking 800 and in my head, I'm saying, just play it cool play it cool, don't jump out of your seat and just accept the 800, count to three before you celebrate. And, and before I could get to three in my head, he said, all right, God damn it, and he hit the table. He said, how about $900? But you do realize it's a 30 day assignment. And then the light bulb went off in my head that he meant per day. And I thought, 
he meant $800 for the entire trip. And, you know, I joke, Mike, that if, if I had an iPhone then and not the brick of a cell phone, I would have under the table, you know, set up a group text to my parents, my faculty advisor, all of my friends. And I was said, I'm done. I'm done with college. I'm out. <laughs> but this was a huge stepping stone moment. I went to the Sahara Desert. There's this incredible assignment we shot on, you know, generation one digital cameras. We uploaded right. via satellite to this thing called the World Wide Web. I think 13 people probably saw the project because nobody had email, nobody understood the internet. But it was really, it opened my eyes to, wow, I can really make it. I, people will hire me potentially um, to, to make pictures, to do what I love doing. And uh, yeah, it's one of those truly a stepping stone moment that changed who I am professionally. So I, I think this picture, picture speaks to the subjective nature of photography, what works, what doesn't, what's good, what's not, what some will love and some won't. I mean, that's just the nature of the business. But how did you feel before we move on to the next picture to have that first ad? When you opened up a magazine, you see, I remember what it was like when I saw my first cover and it's such a great feeling. How did you feel seeing this picture in print for the very first time? Yeah, I, I remember, you know, I was such a cheap bastard like just broke college kid that I you know I was emerging in my career but I remember buying that issue of outside magazine for you know six bucks or whatever 395 mm -hmm. and I but I didn't want to buy more because I didn't want to waste my money on buying magazines I, I wanted to buy more film and I remember I had it on my you know I bought one to cut out the page and then I bought another to leave on like the coffee table and I remember you know friends would come over and flip through and I'd say hey hey easy on the mag don't mess up the page but no I was I was deeply proud I mean I I think I was proud of seeing it in print and I also it just like unlocked a part of my brain where I realized wow I just got paid to do exactly what I love to do I just went on a trip with people that I cared about I had an adventure with the and it was a wild adventure I got to make pictures. I just gritty raw pic. I didn't have to set it up or coach anything. I was being a journalist. I was being a photojournalist. And then I got a paycheck for it. And then on top of that, it led to another opportunity. You know, Mike, I think you said something that's interesting, which is photography is super subjective. I mean, it's, I like to say that there's something called the collective subjective, right? And it's, it's photography, a photograph, it either it's, it's good or it's bad. And if it's good, it, mm -hmm. people react to it they it moves people you have some reaction and if you don't react it's not a good picture and if mm -hmm. everybody reacts which is the collective subjective it's a good picture but it is very subjective it's just it's what do the masses think about that photograph and and this you know it's there's two different skill sets there's the skill of taking a picture and then there's the skill of editing and i'm the first to admit i think i'm I'm pretty good at taking pictures. I'm not always the best editor. And like, and I think James- I am a Siebert, horrible editor. I'm a horrible editor. Yeah, it's, and they're really, and I think that's the gift of a true editor is they have the ability to channel subjectively what the world, what the collection of folks who look at this picture, how they're going to perceive it. And that was the gift that Jane Siebert had in selecting this photograph of, of, um, you know, of Tom. So what, what are we looking at now? A rock climber from a very odd position. Um, yeah, yeah. So what, this is here? this is Tommy Caldwell. This is Tommy's arguably one of the um, one of my best friends, but also one of the best rock climbers of all time. You know, he's the uh, you know he's the Michael Jordan of of rock climbing. I mean, he's a, an incredible human being, um, fantastic human. But on top of that is maybe one of the most well-rounded uh, climbers of all time. Um, and this is, this is, you know, I'm showing this photo because I think there's a lesson in it. Uh, this was a shoot that I did on the side of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. Um, Tommy, Tommy was the first male climber to free climb the nose of El Capitan. And for any climber that's listening to this podcast, um, if you know any history of climbing, the most storied uh, rock climb on the planet is called the Nose of El Capitan. It's the prow in Yosemite National Park on El Capitan. And some 20 years ago, uh, the first person to free climb the nose, and free climb means to climb it still with a rope, 
but only for protection, but only using your hands and feet to get up that particular wall. It was Lynn Hill, an incredible athlete who Mike, didn't you go to, am I making that up? Did you go to Vietnam with, with Lynn Hill and Beth Wald or was Lynn on that trip? I don't know that. No. Um, Rolo, Rolando. Ah, okay. Time, her husband was on that trip. Got it. Okay. So Lynn Hill is, is one of the greatest athletes of all time, male or female. Lynn Hill free climbs the nose close to 20 years ago. And then every great rock climber in the world tries to repeat free climbing the nose, male and female, and no one can do it for close to 15 years. Never happens in sport, right? That's a really rare phenomena. And, and then Beth Rodden comes along, another incredible athlete who you have met, Mike. And she's the second human to free climb the nose. So two women, first Lynn Hill, then Beth Rodden, they free climb the nose. The third human being to free climb the nose is Tommy Caldwell. And uh, Tommy, Tommy is the first male to free climb the nose. So I'm up on El Capitan where, gosh, 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet off the ground. And this is what's called the crux pitch. It's the hardest 20 feet of rock climbing on this 3,000 foot route. And it's called the changing corners pitch. And as you can tell from this photograph, that's a pretty tough position to be in. It's all body tension and Tommy's pushing on one side of the wall and, you know, he's getting his sticky rubber shoes to stick and body tension and slowly moving up the wall. And we got up really early that morning so that he could climb in the shade because he didn't want to be sweating. So he wanted cold temperatures so he could, you know, not be sweating and stick to the rock. And so I had rigged my rope in such a way that I, it was rigged 300 feet above me so I could be hanging farther out in space and really separate myself from the wall. A lot of climbing photography is preconceiving where do you want to be to make the picture? And then the amount of logistics to get there. You know, it's not like standing in a studio where you take three steps to the right or you squat down or get on a ladder. It's enormous amounts of logistics to get yourself into these places, moving ropes and climbing and rappelling and rigging stuff. Mm. And so I'm hanging on this rope. The sun is coming up. It's, it's pretty early in the morning. And, and I'm shooting, I'm looking through my legs, kind of shooting down at Tommy and out of focus in the background, you can see his then wife, Beth Rodden in the blue jacket. Beth is belaying Tommy, meaning she's managing the rope for Tommy. And then I realize it's like a, you know, a, you can't do this. It's a, it, I'm, I'm blowing it. My rope, my white rope is going back into the photograph, meaning it's tied to the anchor where Beth is belaying. And so there's a right. white line. It, it, I mean, and I would liken it to taking a beautiful landscape photo and then realizing your feet are in the shot. You know, that, that you, you have to take your feet out of the shot. My rope is in the shot. So Tommy is doing one of the hardest pitches of rock climbing in the world. And I yell down to Beth. I say, hey, Beth, I hate to do this, but can you unclip my rope from the wall? so that it's not in the shot. Now, meanwhile, Beth, she's pretty busy. She's like belaying her husband on the hardest rock climb in the world. And so she leans in quickly, unclips my rope, it swings out into space. It's no longer in the photograph. I take some pictures and, and then Tommy blows out of the corner. He falls and Beth catches him with the rope and Tommy's really frustrated. And so Beth, I'm kind of setting myself up to repel down my and Beth is going to lower Tommy back down to that ledge where she's standing and I'm going to rappel down and he's going to need 20 or 30 minutes to rest before he can give it another real try. And so he starts getting lowered at about the same time I'm rappelling down the rope and Tommy's, you know, 10 feet, six feet away from me and we're talking and, you know, I'm trying to like, with a good friend, I'm trying to lessen the stress. I can tell he's very frustrated. So, you know, I kind of make a joke. I say, hey, Tommy, do you want me to get on the, on lead and show you how to climb this section. And he, you know, doesn't think it's that funny, but he responds with, you want me to shoot some in focus photos, Corey, you know, kind of the train changing of roles. And, and so we're kind of, you know, just making one another laugh. And as we're, we're lowering and repelling at the same pace and Tommy says, stop, what are you doing? He says really abruptly as he's looking at my hands and I say, what? And I stop and he's staring at my hands and I look down and I realize that I'm, you know, a few inches from the end of the rope with no knot in the end because, you know, Beth wasn't, it's my responsibility to manage the rope. She just cut it loose to get it out of the photograph. Right. And, you know, I realized in that, in that instant, I was 
just a, a second or two away from rappelling straight off the end of the rope into space and free falling 1500 feet, 2000 feet to the ground. I'm, and it I'm was that, that reminder. Happen, I'm, I'm so glad that didn't happen. I have me to, too. I have to, and, and, and it really, I think it's important to understand. I, we had an interview with um, Brian Scarry who, underwater and marine life, marine wildlife. And, and there's a truth. I mean, the same thing here with you, that diving is important to him and understanding every safety precaution in diving. Yeah. You have to be great as a rock climber to feel comfortable enough then to bring in the element of the camera. No, uh, speak to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always say that, you know, it's, it's safety, safety's first, right? You getting yourself into that position, you get there and you're double and triple checking, you know, are you tied in correctly or clipped in correctly? But then you actually have to kind of change gears. You have to mm. switch out of, okay, now I'm not being a rock climber and a mountain guide and I'm, it's no longer about the rigging. You need to switch gears and now be creative. And I, you know, Brian and I have never talked about that, but I think there's a very similar parallel, which sure. is in the climbing in the mountains, I'm so comfortable in the mountains and so comfortable hanging on a vertical wall that it's very easy for me to switch from being a climber to then blocking all of that out. I've already addressed the safety and the, you know, the, the ice and snow that can fall on top of me and the rock fall and is the rope mm -hmm. running over an edge. And then it's, you switch gears, you almost go from like first gear to reverse. And in reverse, now all I'm thinking about is the creative. What's happening in this rectangle through the camera? Is my exposure correct? What, yeah. at which moment, what's the right composition of my vertical, horizontal, that subtlety of being a photographer, thinking about light, composition, and moment. And, but you're just constantly in a, in a day hanging on the side of El Capitan. You're going from first to reverse thousands of times. And you're, while you're in that, that kind of first year, trying to get yourself into the next position. You're also preconceiving the next shot and making decisions about, is this worth it? Am I investing the right amount of time and energy to get to this location? If I shoot this photograph, then am I gonna miss the one that's 35 feet above because I need to like get back up the rope and Jumar in the end. And so there's this dance that's constantly happening. You know, I, I do, I, something that I, I learned early on is there's no photograph worth getting hurt for and certainly not dying. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, the lesson that I walked away with from almost propelling off the rope is, you know, and, and this applies to Brian, this applies to me, I think it applies to many folks that work in these environments. It's easy to get complacent. I mean, I, you know, I used to joke back then, Bell Cap was my office. I mean, I spent so much time hanging on ropes and in vertical environments that it just, it just felt so normal and natural and you would take for, it was easy to take for granted where you were and it was human error. It was my mistake not paying attention to the fundamental basic safety principles that allowed me to almost propel off the end of the rope. So never get too complacent. I mean, that's, that's the reality. That's, that's a great yeah. lesson for everyone tuning in. And, and I love this picture. I love the angle. I know you've taken you know some brilliant pictures over time. I've seen them all, especially those in the book, but the, just the angle, the intensity, you know, how he's looking up at you. Um, and, and thank you for sharing that because it's a great picture. We're going we're gonna to roll on to uh, another favorite of mine that I've seen yeah. you present before, but uh, give me just a little backstory of the behind the scenes on this photo. Sure. You know, Mike, and you asked why did I pick the particular photos that we're talking about tonight? And so much of it is, you know, just what I feel. Um, I just went to, to Chile um, to shoot Dane Jackson. Dane is the little boy. Let's see, let me see this photo. I think he's on the, yeah, he's the young guy in the kayak on the left side. And Dane is now, I think, 26 years old. He was probably like seven or eight years old in this photograph. So this was shot a while ago. I'm bad with time, but, you know, bottom line is it was shot a while ago. But this is, this is the Jackson kayak family. They're, Eric Jackson's driving the car. Um, Eric is one of the greatest kayakers of all time. He's an Olympian and multi-time world champion. Um, his two kids are on the roof rack of his car, Emily Jackson and Dane Jackson. They're both now world champions. Christine, uh, their mom, and Eric's wife is in the passenger seat. And I, I years ago, going on, you know, 20 years ago, did another book project. And, and it was called uh, My Favorite Place. And the concept was... I wanted to go and spend a day or a couple of days with the most elite athletes in the world and have them take me on a, a tour 
at their backyard playground where they fell in love with the sport. And the very first phone call that I made when I embarked on this project was to Eric Jackson. And I called Eric and I said, Eric, I pitched him on the idea of the book. And I, I didn't get more than like 10 sentences into my pitch before Eric said, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you come out anytime. And then, and then I said, oh, really? You're like, you'd love to have myself and a writer. And a week later, two weeks later, we flew to Rock Island, Tennessee. And, um, and it was such an incredible experience. We stayed with the Jacksons. And, and we asked, where should we stay? Should we stay in a hotel? Or, you know, it's just the logistics of a project. He said, nope, you guys are staying with us. He said, There's, you know, it's too far away. The hotel is 30 minutes away. And he kicked his kids out of their bunk bed. <laughs> and the writer and I, I got the top bunk. Jason got the bottom bunk. And we spent a week with the Jacksons. And they became, re really, they became fast friends and lifelong friends. And this photograph was shot on that first trip to Rock Island, Tennessee, or maybe this was another trip. But, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, what I learned watching Eric is that he embraces an unconventional lifestyle. He, his, he raised his kids, Christine and Eric raised their kids, mostly in a motorhome, driving around the United States, going from river to river, you know, the best flows around the world. They homeschooled their kids. You know, that Eric, I'll never forget. I mean, Eric's kayaking partners, even at this time when I shot the photograph, were his two kids. Every day, Eric and his two kids would get in the water and paddle for hours. And, you know, I think Eric, what I learned from Eric and what I've learned, you know, spending time with Emily and Dane is this is what passion looks like. This is what passion looks like when you really love what you do and it's ingrained in who you are. You know, it right. opens the, the possibility of becoming a great. And Dane is one of those greats. Um, you know, so this photograph, the way this came about, we were having lunch and it was, I was getting ready to drive back to the airport. You know, we're eating turkey sandwiches on Eric's deck. You know, and their house is perfectly positioned just across the road from the river where they kayak every morning. And we're eating turkey sandwiches. And I said to Eric, Hey, anything else you want to photograph while I'm here? You know, I'm going to start packing my bags here soon. And Eric said, that, yeah, you know, I've always wanted, he scratched his head and he said, I've always wanted to shoot the kids sitting in the roof rack of my car in their kayaks. And, you know, and it, the lesson is athletes at this level, they don't mistakenly end up as greats. It's beyond just their physical attributes. It's also their mental attributes. They have a vision for how they want to be portrayed and spotting aesthetic lines in the climbing world and being creative. And that's exactly what happened here. Eric just had a brilliant idea. And, you know, my favorite photograph sadly was out of focus. There was a photo with Eric, he had both of his hands out the driver's side window and he was steering with mm -hmm. his knees. And that would have even gotten more response because people definitely, there's mixed response to this photograph. It's either on one end of the spectrum, these guys are lunatics. This is so risky what he's doing with his kids. When the truth is the risk they take every day in the river is 5X what they're doing in this vehicle. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the perspective, which is God, these, guys are, these guys are living a free life. They're, they're designing their own life. They, they, you know, they're writing their own guidebook or manual into how to lead a fulfilling life. And, and I think they do exactly that. Um, Dane and I, anyhow, I just went to, to Chile with Dane. He just, just dropped the second tallest waterfall that a human has ever dropped. And uh, we shot it with a bunch of cameras, Nikon cameras and drones and POV cameras on their head. And there's some fun footage on my website or Dane Jackson on Instagram. And you can see what a 134 foot waterfall looks like. To go over yeah, I was, was going to say that um, I've seen the stuff that you guys did um, and I saw what Dane showed and some of the cool parts of that. Like you said, this isn't just like dropping down the waterfall, how, how he positions himself, he angles himself, he goes through all of these pre-drop, uh, I guess, rituals or, you know, thoughts to see where he's going to move within that. And it's really dangerous. He makes it look easy, but I mean, it's, it's kind of death defying in a way, no? Uh -huh. It's, you know, I just, we looked at a picture of Tommy Caldwell climbing. Now we're looking at this picture of Dane Jackson as a kid. But mm -hmm. in sequence, you're looking at pictures of two of the greatest athletes ever. I mean, really, Tommy is one of the greatest rock climbers of all time in all of mankind. He's, he's one of the greats. And Dane Jackson, 
I think if you you poll the kayaking community right now and ask them, you know, where does Dane fit in the hierarchy of kayaking? It's safe to say that he's one of the greats of all time. He's the most one of the most well-rounded elite athletes. And being in Chile, watching him going over this 134 foot waterfall, you know, I was surrounded by lots of Chilean kayakers who were operating camp. You know, we had a big crew that we put together and all of them said in a different way, mostly in broken English and Spanish. They said, this guy, he's like a God. He's like a God, like what that he can mentally process what he's about to do and be so calm and those micro adjustments of his body with so much confidence. So, yeah, he's a humble guy, but when they say confidence, it's the confidence to go into a 134 foot waterfall that no one has ever you know, dropped or attempted and just make those micro adjustments and just do it perfectly. You know, that's, that's that, you know, it, when we talk about this in photography, there's good and then there's great, you know, Dane and Tommy, they're the greats. They're the, they're really the greats. Beth is one of the greats, Beth Rodden in the, in the yeah. out of focus, you know, these are the greats. And I feel like, I said this at the start of our conversation. It's one of the great, great privileges of being a photographer is to have the opportunity to document these greats, to make pictures, storytelling pictures of these folks, but to spend time with them. And I know that you know they rub off on me. I mean, I think I become a better person because I watch how they operate at the highest level. And you know, I think we can all learn from that. You know, it's, I, sure, I, I'm a guy that loves. Yeah, sorry, Mike. Yeah, no, no, finish your thought. Oh, I just, you know, I love, you know, when I'm not spending time around people like Tommy and Dane and Beth, I find myself listening and reading, you know, biographies and autobiographies because that's how you learn. That's how you learn you know, how people think and how they perform at a high level. I, th I think the backstory to all this speaks to the power of relationships. And I think that's what carries all of us through life. But in my boat and final thought on this picture is I'm glad he actually has his hand on the steering wheel. Maybe I'm a little <coughs> old codger now, but it's a safer way to go. But let's move <coughs> on to the next photo. We've got uh, about 20 minutes left, Corey. So you know, think about sure. uh, pacing yourself here. But this is an extraordinary picture. Talk about it. Sure. You know, I wanted to show one photo where I just made a mistake. You know, it's, it goes back to that idea of, you know, as professionals, we don't nail it every time, even though sometimes we want you to believe that we do. So I for, I live in Lake Tahoe, California, and mm -hmm. years ago, now going on, geez, over over 15 years ago, I, I was courted to start doing the ad campaigns for the big ski resort here in town called Heavenly, and it's mm -hmm. owned by Vail Resorts. And I, I my client um, was John Wagner. John is an incredible guy. I've learned so much working with John. And, and he really instilled in me perfection. It's, you know, there's high expectations. They were spending real money. And there's these fleeting moments, these finite moments. And I learned that in photography early on, but in the ski business, there's also these finite windows where you can make great photos. The snow has to be just right. You need 12 to 24 inches of cold snow overnight. You need the storm to clear out. You need sun the next morning. And that only happens a few times a year if you're lucky. No other so we would, yeah, I mean, it's, those are when the conditions are incredible, but those are also the incredible conditions for making photographs. Mm -hmm. And so one year, John and I had decided we were going to shoot from the air. I felt like I had exhausted my opportunities, you know, working on the mountain. And so we were going to charter a helicopter, you know, this was a big expense. We're going to charter a helicopter and we were going to hire something like 20 or 30 athletes and position mm -hmm. them on the mountain. I, they weren't going to fly in the helicopter. We were going to position everybody with chairlifts and snowmobiles in the dark so that when the sun came up over Nevada, you know, and that, and that east facing slope of heavenly went into the sun, we would have surface to ground radios or surface to air radios. So I could in the helicopter tell, okay, athlete number one, drop your line. And I would shoot. And, and my good buddy and your friend, Dane Henry was shooting video in the same helicopter. So Dane and I are, elbow to elbow. I think one of us was in the front seat. One of us was in the back of the helicopter and we're harnessed in and we're, you know, the helicopter's flying at 10,000 feet or so. And, you know, every shot I had orchestrated, what did I want in the frame? You know, the lines were pretty specific. And this shot of Mikey Weir, good friend of mine, great snowboarder. Um, I had this vision. I had this preconceived idea. This was where a forest fire had ripped through heavenly. 
And right. I just had this graphic vision of Mikey making a turn right through these burned out trees. And, but it's moving fast. You know, we only have, you have what, 30 or 40 minutes of good light and then the light starts getting crappier. And so we're moving fast and the helicopter time's expensive and, and, um, and we're having logistical problems. People aren't where they need to be. And so, you know, you're managing all of this stress. It's that same thing. You're shifting from logistics like first year to being creative to reverse. Like now you need to be creative and I'm toggling back and forth, and communicating with people on the ground and we're set up for this shot. And it's really hard from 500 feet above the ground to give direction to a snowboarder when you're looking at a field of white with you know hundreds of burnt trees. And so I'm trying to describe to Mikey, okay, Mikey, you're gonna go to that big tree on your left and then you're gonna bang a turn that's about 10 feet away from that tree. And we have this, and there's the rotor sound and it's loud and wind blowing into the helicopter. And, and uh, Mikey says, okay, okay. And so, you know, I say three, two, one. And then the, the way it worked, I think was he would say three, two, one dropping. Then he'd put his radio in his pocket, which would take five seconds. And then, so I'm, I'm like, I've got this shot framed up. It's gonna be incredible, Mike. And I shoot a few test frames, I shoot a few more. And then, you know, five seconds passes, 10 seconds pass, 15. And I think, where the hell is Mikey? And I finally look over the top of my camera and I realize he's like at the bottom of the mountain. We're just, we were talking about two different trees. Oh, God. And my heart sank because I thought, <laughs> geez, this is, you know, the, you can't publish excuses is the bottom line. Like, you know, you, everybody yeah. has excuses, but you can't publish excuses. And so... In the aftermath, you know, we cycled all the athletes twice and we shot Mikey somewhere else making a turn and it was a beautiful turn. And in the aftermath, I sat in John's office and I started giving him the excuse as to why we didn't make this picture. And I realized I could read his face. He might have even used those words, Corey, we can't publish excuses. And, mm -hmm. and being a guy that grew up in the journalism world, right, many of the pictures that I've shot they're, they're uncoached, they're real true documentary photographs. Wow. But we went back, this was advertising, and we went back and we photoshopped Mikey into this image. This is a mistake, I, I didn't, I missed the shot, like poor communication. So we mm -hmm. took a frame of Mikey snowboarding, he really was snowboarding, and we stuck him in that, the composition that I really wanted to shoot. Mm -hmm. And it got used widely. But you know, the truth is I, I share this photo and that story because, well, you know, this isn't an intentional mistake. It's just, it's human nature. Like communication broke down. I missed the shot. It's a great shot. Would it have been better if it happened in one frame? Absolutely. I'd be more satisfied. I don't feel deep satisfaction. You fulfilled that assignment to be clear. It's advertising, so it's not journalism. So of that's course right. you can do as many layers as you want on this. But I think, again, that's, it's important that the solution was there and you didn't kill that time. And yeah, again, we could have, we all wish that pictures are perfect every time but that's that's a great story uh and and again failure breeds success does it not yeah. let's move on to this yeah. next photo um we have uh, about uh, 12 minutes left Corey. so i know you got a few more coming up so sure sure yeah this is um this was a trip to the karakoram in pakistan this the same mountain range which is the second highest mountain in the world k2 and, and I was with two very dear friends, um, Peter Ortner and David Lama. Um, at that moment in time, it's safe to say that these were two of the greatest alpine climbers in the world. Um, and, and it's hard, it's hard for me to look at this picture because David's no longer with us. He died in the Canadian Rockies last year. Um, so but David and Peter, they were, they were on a mission to free climb the Trango Tower, which is a 20,000 foot tall uh, granite face in the Karakoram Mountains, one of the greatest rock faces on the planet, you know, outside of Yosemite National Park. And, and we're, we're camped at about 18,000 feet or so here. And it was cold. It, we had been climbing all day. You know, I was dehydrated and tired and cold. And, you know, when you're operating at above, you know, 15,000 feet, 17,000 feet, everything just gets harder. You know, you move slower, your head hurts, you always kind of, have a, you don't sleep that well. And, but as a photographer, when we, we dug out the snow cave and we started getting set up to cook dinner, I could see the potential for a great photograph. I could see that at some point their headlamps, the exposure of their headlamps was gonna match the exposure of the sky behind them. 
And that's one of the realities as a photographer is you have to embrace those situations and they're not always comfortable. You have to embrace discomfort. And so I played that game, you know, it was an hour, two hours before that light was going to be right. But I knew that if I crawled into that sleeping bag and started, boy, took off my boots and crampons and, and Gore-Tex pants, I wasn't going to get out of the sleeping bag. And so I played that mental game with myself. I right. stood there with the wind blowing in my face and uncomfortable. And I thought about everything except um, where I was. I dreamt about getting home and petting my dog and seeing my wife and buying a Chipotle burrito mm -hmm. when I was back in the United States. And I waited it out. I, I, you know, I gutted it out and it made for this picture. I wanted the possibility, the opportunity to try to make this picture. And when I share this picture, it's always a reminder to me that yeah, as a photographer, you know, it's, it's your job to embrace being a little uncomfortable. When we step outside of that comfort zone, it oftentimes mm -hmm. leads to some of the best photographs and the best unique experiences in our life, right? If you're, if you're sitting in your home or your hotel room, watching the sunrise out the window and drinking coffee, you're kind of blowing it. And right. if you're sitting in your home or hotel room, watching the sunset and having a cocktail, you're kind of blowing it. And believe me, I love coffee and I love cocktails. But that's your moment to be out there. And it's and it's not always comfortable setting the alarm for 4 a.m. It's, it's brutal, you know, eating dinner at 10 p.m. because you were out shooting until 930. That's tough. Sure. But that's where you make great pictures and it makes you appreciate. I'm looking at my feet right now. I'm wearing flip flops. And I'll tell you, like wearing flip flops. When, you, when do you not wear flip flops, dude? Only in places I like know. Pakistan. Yeah. Only like high in the mountains. Do I not wear? But it makes you my point is. When you're wearing uncomfortable boots and crampons at 20,000 feet and your feet are freezing and you're dehydrated, guess what? It makes wearing flip-flops at home feel a whole lot better. Well, I, I will then throw this out to anybody viewing. Uh, you did a TED Talks on embracing discomfort and it was like about 12 to 15 minutes. It was a great, great talk. So people should look that up. Again, another awesome photo. Uh, of course, uh, uh, sorry about your friend. I guess that's, again, the part of the relationships. Uh, we got a, a couple more photos to get through in about uh, eight minutes, brother. So what do we got going on here? I know I've seen this picture before. Yeah. I believe it's the cover of your book, right? It is. It is. You know, this is the one, I mean, I'm proud of many of the photos that we've talked about today, but you know, the, the question every photographer gets is, you know, what's your favorite photograph? Mm -hmm. And I've, I've never answered that question. And I still, I'm not sure that I have a favorite photograph that I've shot mm -hmm. or, or a photograph that I'm, it's perfect. But this might be as close to it. This is this this gets close to a photograph that really I'm proud of, and I and I want to make an important point. I think it's a nice photograph from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. Compositionally, it's interesting. The light's beautiful. Um, it's a great moment. It's a meaningful moment. But the reason, the reason that this is one of my favorite photos, and I'm not going to say my favorite, but one of my favorite, it's because of the backstory. It's sure. because this is. These are two people that I care deeply about. And this is a historic, this will turn out to be a historic photograph. This, this is Tommy Caldwell ascending a rope and Kevin Jorgensen is sitting in the portal edge. Mm -hmm. And they're on the first ascent of the Don Wall in Yosemite National Park. And this got a ton of attention in the media. A feature length film was made about this ascent. But for me, what this does is it brings back memories of being on the wall with two of my buddies, three of my buddies, actually, for 10 days. And, and this, is this epitomizes why I started taking pictures, why I picked up the camera in the first place. It was to be in wild places, to be surrounded by people that I cared about, to be pushing the limits photographically, but also from an athletic standpoint, they're pushing the limits as climbers. And, and having genuine, real experiences. And, and this, you know, my memories of this experience beyond the media attention, beyond the film, beyond how often these photographs got published, it's, you know, my memories are sitting on the portal ledge in the middle of the night under a star-filled sky, you know, telling stories and drinking whiskey with my buddies and making pictures that were meaningful. And that's, you know, I, we talk about in photography, there's three elements to a great photograph, right? It's the moment, the composition, the light, and then it's the story. It's the story. It's what's, what's meaningful about this photograph and maybe even a fifth element, which is it's the people. And this mm -hmm. checks all five of those boxes for me. It's, 
great people, a great story, good composition, good light, and a great moment. And that, those five elements, that makes it a special picture for me. And I love that you can talk to pictures. Like I hate the standard answer when someone says, what's your favorite picture? Well, I haven't taken it yet. Um, I think that's sort of an evasive cop out uh, to, to realize that you've made so many pictures and then this one kind of touches your heart in a special way. I mean, that makes it a favorite and or could be your best picture ever. I kind of break it up into categories of sports and rock and roll and portraits and things like that. One of my favorites. But I love that this picture speaks to you that much because you created it. And it's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's it's and and appropriately. You know, it's the cover of, of stories behind the images, the book. Mm-hmm. And I and I think it's I would never say this is my it's the best photo I've ever shot, but it's one of it's a meaningful photograph. And that's that's the key. It's a solid picture that also has meaning. And that makes it a it puts it in the great category for me. We're going to move on. And uh, our last photo, we got about uh, three minutes to talk about this. I am going to say this is Marina and Layla, your wife and daughter. I love this picture. Of course, uh, I love being Chia Mike to, to Layla. Talk about this photo and what it means to you as we close this out. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've spent a career pursuing adventure and, I, you know, I, I've, I've prided myself on, you know, for 30 years. I, you know, the, I think I, I had a higher score the more time I spent on the road, the more time I spent on adventures and in base camps and on airplanes and on trains and planes. and. Boy, that changed for me when I had a daughter, Marina. You know, I married my wife, Marina, and and then we had a little girl, Layla. And now I, you know, life is life is even fuller. It's actually more fulfilling now, with mm-hmm. a with a little girl who looks up to me as her father. And now I'm, you know, this is the evolution um, in any career in any life. I'm I'm learning to put higher value. Um, on time that I get to spend with my family and Mm -hmm. and we've really tried to adapt adapt our lives in such a way that uh, we travel a lot as a family by the time Layla was you know two she had you know two dozen passport stamps you know we just she came along like luggage with us on trips and and now I'm just much more selective I um I want to make sure that my time at home counts and I want to make sure that my time in the field counts and I'm really present and really kind of operating at 110% no matter where I am. And I have to say it's, you know, it's one of, it's the silver lining or the mixed blessing, you know, to this, to this entire craziness that we're in right now is I am despite, despite all of the unknown, I'm just really cherishing this time at home with my family. And because that's, you know, look, we don't get this very often and certainly not in my line of work. Do I get to be home for this long and not see trips on the calendar? And uh, I think having a positive attitude at this moment and kind of acknowledging, of course, being aware of the, the sort of the challenges, but also embracing the positive, embracing this opportunity to be with the people that you love most. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, I'm, I'm pinching myself every day. Well, I, I will again, go back to that word relationships, and I'm going to bring you back um, to full screen. Let me get out of, uh, out of keynote and, uh, and let me see you again. Uh, it means everything to me and our relationship means everything to me. You've had me in your home a number of times. We, of course, we're colleagues, but I think we're more brothers than we are anything else. And so it's even more special to talk to you about your photos. And, you know, we've done interviews at trade shows before, and we had you speak at a, a million things. And, and you've done quite a few assignments. We have done quite a few assignments together. But um, I think the one moment that I reflect on was when m- me, you, Marina, her sister, and Layla uh, climbed uh, Mount Talak, hiked uh, Mount Talak, and just make me feel good. It was what nine thousand feet, eight thousand feet. Yeah, that's at nine thousand, or maybe yeah, maybe just over, just under ten, or just over ten. I can't remember. Yeah. And I could barely make it to the top on my own. And you're doing this with Layla on your back the whole way. So, brother, uh, much respect uh, <laughs> for everything you do. Again, thank you for taking the time to share the backstories to these great, great photos. Uh, again, uh, where, where would people look you up? Is it Corey Rich? Uh, is your Instagram? Yeah, I, th- I think the easiest is my website's CoreyRich.com. And on Instagram, I'm Corey Rich Productions. No. Thank you again for giving us this time. Thank you, people uh, that are tuning in on these uh, really nice talks. 
with some of our great ambassadors. Um, again, Corey, thank you. Please be safe. Much love to uh, Marina, Layla, and all of the people around you, your family, your mom and dad. Um, people tuning in, we got more of this, uh, this great content coming your way. So for Nikon, I am Mike Corrado. Everybody, please be safe, and we'll see you again. Thanks, Mike.